I've come up with two examples. I have some cucumber tests that will run on web. So here is a very simple test that says when we're on the inventory page and we add one item to the cart, we'll have that one item in the cart. So if we navigate to our test steps, so here are some important, some important information to get this set up. So just to kind of catch everyone up to speed for the teams that are not doing web automation, this is pretty much how you configure a remote web driver using Selenium. So we're setting our Sauce Labs username and access key, which are very important. You get those from your Sauce Labs user interface. Let me show you guys where you get that. You come here to account and then you go to user settings. And then in your user settings, you'll see your username, that's your username, and then your access key that you'll just copy. Our, the industry standard is to put those in environment variables and not be hard coding them anywhere. So you can see they're being retrieved from environment variables. And the reason why that's nice is because they will only be stored on your local machine. So that means that when you run tests on your machine, they will always work for your user and go to your dashboard. And then when you run these tests in CI and these username and access key will be stored for your CI user, and then they'll be read from there. And so nobody needs to be sharing any kind of credentials. Then over here, you can see that we are configuring some sauce options where we are setting our username and access key, and we are passing in our scenario name. Down here, we're configuring browser options. So we're passing in stuff like Chrome, we're passing in our sauce options. And here's the configuration for the Chrome. We're saying we're running on Chrome, latest with Windows 10. Just hitting this URL, this is the sauce hub URL. And then we are starting a brand new remote web driver session. And so let's go ahead and run it. I'll show you guys what that looks like. So that will appear as you guys saw over here. This was for live testing. All the automated results go in the automated part. We come to test results and we'll see that here we have one test that's running right now. You can see this is the one I started less than a minute ago. It shows the name of the test. If you specify, it's highly recommended that you specify the name of the test, which was being set uh, right here by setting this capability, the name capability. And that's how this is coming in from. And then if we open this up, you guys will see a recording of this test. So there's a video here that shows what happened. So here you can see it opened up this page, it added an item to a cart, and then checked that that item was there. Um, you can see there's this check mark here that says that the test was completed successfully. Over here on the right hand side, you can see all the Selenium commands that were executed. So if you want to expand them further, you will be able to see more information about it. So for example, here, you can see that it was trying to find a button. You can even see that it was using CSS selector, and this is the value that it searched for. And then it found, once it finds this, it can perform different kinds of operations here. You can see one thing that I see many teams struggle with when they move from local test execution to remote grid execution using a Selenium remote grid is they don't realize the impact of web requests on their test automation. So the more of these commands that we have in our test, the slower and the flakier our test will be. So it's very important to not waste a lot of Selenium commands on unnecessary actions. So some problems that I see there happen to be like, People tend to wait like way too long. They'll keep polling in interval for like one or two minutes when it's totally unnecessary. I'll see many clients that are, for example, maybe they'll find an element, but besides only finding an element, they'll also start checking all of its attributes, enable, visible, disabled, blah, blah, blah. And so then there'll be multiple commands and you can see how these commands will quickly start to add up and make your tests seem slow just because there are so many. So just keep that in mind as you all are designing your automation. Let's see what else is important here. Uh, there's logs. If you really want to dig in here, you can, and you can always download them. Um, there's more metadata here as well. This could be, this is pretty useful to know. You can see uh, the user that started it. Um, you can see some other capabilities that were passed in that were 
We are recording screenshots. We're recording videos. This is what all comes from our uh, mutable capabilities object and what we configure in here. You guys can download all of these resources. You can see you can download this video and you can download the screenshots as well. You can also do it in an automated manner. We have a RESTful API that a lot of customers like to use. And what they'll do is actually run against the RESTful API and they will automatically download all of the resources from all of the tests on like a daily basis because these resources will only be stored for 30 days. And so after 30 days, they're cleared out for security purposes. So some customers may want to keep this for much longer. And so you, again, you can either download it manually and share it with your team, or you can do it in an automated manner and be saving it somewhere on a regular basis. So that's a web test. In the future, if you guys ever move to Java 9 and beyond, Sauce Labs has an open source library called Sauce Bindings that makes this part much easier. So for example, you can take a look at all of this code here. And let me see if I have an example using Sauce Bindings here. So uh, Java 9 and above, Sauce Bindings supports that. And you guys can see here that here's us using Sauce Bindings. So it's really one line of code if you just wanted to start a default session. And that one line of code is simply creating a new Sauce session and doing a start. This will automatically default to a Chrome Windows 10 instance. And so again, just something to consider in the future if you guys move to Java 9 and beyond. But until then, you guys will need to use standard Selenium remote web driver protocol.